Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning and good evening to all audiences. Thank you to each and every one of you for being here with us today. We are very pleased to be able to welcome you to Warekada Series 1, The Economic Path of a Nation by Persatuan Mahasiswa Indonesia Seluruh Amerika Serikat Permias Nasional, also known as the Indonesian Students Association in the United States. Warekada Series is an economic conference created by Permias Nasional that will dive deep into Indonesian history to identify how it has transformed and is setting course for the future covering critical points that shape the economic development of Indonesia today. We are beyond grateful to announce that more than 1,000 people from various backgrounds, institutions, universities, and companies in Indonesia and abroad have signed for our three-day event. This achievement emphasizes the commitment of Permias National to engage with as many stakeholders through Pentahelix collaborations involving academia, business sectors, communities, governments, and media to shape future leaders of Indonesia studying in the United States today. The word Warekada means to speak in biggest Bugis language. This hopefully motivates our Indonesian students in the United States to speak up and take action on their ideas for the goods of the humanity. We do believe that as a young generation of Indonesia, Permia students have to learn from the past to project into the future in order to prepare Indonesia to excel worldwide and become a global leader in economic academia and civilizations. Before we get started, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to all of you who generously helped us make this event come together to become a success. I would like to convey my highest appreciation to Permias National Organizing Committee for their spirit, effort, and hard work in organizing this conference. I also thank our counterparts, the American Institute for Indonesian Studies, represented by Professor Sidar Chandra from Michigan State University, Indonesia Mengglobal, Good News from Indonesia, Marketeers, Indonesian Professional Associations in the United States, Sustainable Development Goals Centers Universitas Pajajaran, represented by Professor Zuziana, and all youth and students organizations that have worked hand in hand with Permias for the success of Warekada Series. We also thank all invited speakers for their um, time and dedication for us. Last but not least, I would like to thank Chiefs of missions of the Republic of Indonesia in the, to the United States in Washington, D.C., New York, Chicago, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Houston, and the United Nations in New York for their unending support for Permias, especially in brainstorming and promoting Warekada series to their counterpart institutions as an effort to help the recovery of Indonesia economy during the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you very much for listening, and I am pleased to present you the Wareka de Series 1, The Economic Path of a Nation by Permias National. Thank you. Wabilahi Taufik wal Hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning and good evening. Hi, everyone. Good morning, Indonesian time, and good evening, United States time. Welcome to the Warekada by Permias Nasional. This is basically our special event, forum of lectures and discussion of an economic overview of Indonesia. This is basically the whole complete package from the past, present, and also future of our economics. First, let me introduce myself. I'm Gresika Bunga. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I'll be responsible for hosting the Warekada session today. I also will invite you all to be able to discuss with us so if you have any question during the session, just write them on the live chat column. Today, we'll have three incredibly inspiring speakers. The first one is Dr. Farah Bifati. He will explore about the order lama economics. The second one is the Professor Sida Chandra, who will explore of the order baru economics for a new era. And also, last but not least, Bapak Faisal Basri, Indonesian Energy and Mineral Industry. And Everyone, this is Warekada by Permias National of the Economic Path of Nations. And of course, the speakers who come today are extraordinary and capable in their thoughts. I'm glad to welcome Bapak Farabi Fakih, who will present economic decolonization of the early independence period of Indonesia. Dr. Farabi Fakih is a lecturer, 
at the history department in University Gajah Mada or UGM. He has worked on the spread and development of management ideas and its impact on state society relations in Indonesia during the early independence period. He also works on the political economy of urban history and knowledge decolonization of Indonesia. His book on the history of Indonesian management is coming out soon. We can't wait to learn a lot from you, Pak. So everyone, this is Bapak Farabi Fakir. Uh, hello, Jessica Bunga. Hello, Bapa. How are you today? Very good. Thank you. <laughs> really hard. Really glad to have you today. So, Bapa, uh, to make the time efficient, the time is yours, Pak. Thank you very much. So, let me just uh, start by sharing um my discussion first of all i want to uh, thank you all for inviting me uh, to this uh, prestigious uh, uh event uh, i'm very happy uh and uh, i was asked by uh permias uh, mascoto to sort of say a little bit or uh, something on economic decolonization and its legacy and so i want to focus on what um uh, decolonization of the economy uh, and its impact on uh post-independence Indonesian economy. Yeah, so my lecture uh, will be composed of uh, several themes. The first I want to talk about, uh, on a general level, it's about the transformation from a colonial economy to a national economy, and then to focus on the 1950s and 60s, uh, especially uh, in a way that most people think of it as a lost decade. So the question is, is it a lost decade? Um, I want to look at uh, what occurred during the period and the kind of structural retrogression and shift from a colonial economy to a post-colonial economy. And most importantly, I want to see uh, the, its legacies. So how did it play its part in constructing the national economy? Um, so it, in general, uh, how do we, how do we uh, evaluate or uh, understand the effects of the shift of decolonization, especially in the early periods, the early uh, national, uh, the early decades of independence, in which um, uh, there was significant shifts and uh, uh, change to the economy. Now, if you look at this graph, uh, this graph is actually uh, a, a a a graph which compares GDP per capita of uh, Indonesians or people in Java. Um, uh, from the early 19th century to 2000. And we can see that uh, in terms of per capita, Indonesia has reduced its standing in the world. So in comparison to the rest of the world, we used to be a lot richer than today. So a lot of that is, is the effect of colonialism. But, it, uh, but one thing which I want to uh, stress is the is the uh, effect of, of World War II, of course, in the 40s, and then uh, the significant drop of, um, of per capita income in the 50s and 60s in comparison to the rest of the world. So we can see these decades as being the nadir of uh, Indonesian wealth. Um, so looking at this picture, it seems like a very few things to say about it that's good, right? So there's a uh, uh, in general, uh, uh, there is a decline in uh, in in, uh, in wealth uh, per capita of Indonesian that has occurred in a period of 200 years, uh, and its nadir was in the middle 60s. And then we can see a sharp rise during the New Order period when uh, industrialization occurred, and Indonesia sort of reclaimed its position somewhat uh, in terms of. GDP per capita in comparison to the rest of the world. Uh, so in order to understand uh, this aspect, we have to then understand uh, the colonial economy. Um, one particular thing about the colonial economy is that it's quite fragmented. As, you, as we've seen in the, in the last slide, uh, Java and the outer islands are actually two different economies. And so we there's really uh, very little to say about the idea of a national economy. So the, the national economy 
was something that was slowly being integrated up to the 20th century. And in a way, even post-independence Indonesia, uh, the national economy was something that's still uh, coming into being. Um, but the, the kind of economic uh, model that Indonesia, uh, in particular Java, um, uh, had during the colonial period was what was called plantation capitalism, in which land and labor was captured um, and it was uh, focused on export orientation. So it was uh, based in the, in, uh, in, the, in the agricultural heartlands of Java and it was inward looking and feudal in a way within the Javanese uh, society but it was actually export oriented. Uh, the, as, as we see in the, in the, in the last graph, uh, this kind of uh, plantation capitalism is, uh, has not been very good for, uh, for Japanese income. Um, it's not only, uh, it hasn't really seen any, any uh, increase in wealth and, as, as, and in fact, in comparison, it's actually uh, trending downwards. Now in the outer islands, uh, it's a different kind of economy the focus is on smallholder agriculture, and it's much more outward looking, and a lot of the people there actually engage in trading. So there's actually two kinds of economies here. Um, now the economy uh, based on plantation capitalism or the kind of uh, uh, export plantation capitalism that then appeared in the outer islands in the late 19th century in Delhi, in parts of Sumatra, they're highly integrated with the Dutch economy. Um, uh, through various business associations like the Daily Vereniging, the Afros, uh, and they had strong they have strong political connections to the Hague. By the end of the colonial period, over seventy percent of the FDI in Indonesia came from the Netherlands. So it's very much an extension of Dutch uh, economy. Now, since the twentieth century, uh, the, the state, the colonial state, did implement a series of developmentalist programs, uh, which in, in, which include uh, introducing education, agricultural extension microcredits, rural health programs, and so forth. Yet it hasn't really affected um, uh, the vast majority of the people. For instance, very few were educated. Less than 2 million uh, Indonesians uh, had primary education and in tertiary education, it was even, uh, even less uh, apparent. There was less than 100 Indonesian PhD students by the end of the colonial period. So obviously one of the major problems the colonial economy was a lack of skilled manpower. Uh, skilled manpower were imported from the Netherlands uh, because of the strong business connections uh, that uh, the Dutch and the Dutch East Indies economies uh, had. And it also never industrialized. Uh, there was a very lag, uh, lagging period of industrialization. Only in the post 1930s were there efforts to implement uh, institutional reforms that would allow for industrialization. And this was as a result of a fear of Japanese encroachment, um, which uh, the, the kind of pre-war conditions in which uh, geopolitically uh, Batavia was very really scared of increasing Japanese um, encroachment to the Indonesian economy, to the Netherlands Indies economies. Uh, another aspect is the civil service. Uh, very few Indonesians were in the higher administrative and managerial posts. So in all the modern sector of Indonesia, whether in the state or in the, um, in the business sector, the vast majority of the administrative and managerial posts were Europeans. Uh, and so, and looking at the colonial economy, then it, what, what's really striking is that it didn't really allow for a post-independence economy uh, because of the, of the sheer dependence the Indonesian economy had on manpower and on capital and on uh, association with the Netherlands. Um, now, one thing which I think is really interesting and important to understand is that during the colonial periods and up to the end of the colonial period, the, uh, despite the fact that the economy was growing quite well throughout the 20th century, except for the um, uh, the drop after 1930 as a result of the uh, depression, uh, there was actually an increasing um, disparity of income amongst the races between European, Chinese, and Indonesian. Uh, it, it, did, uh, uh, it did sort of merge a little as a result of the, the, the depression era after 1930, but the trend was quite clear in that uh, Indonesians did not uh, take full benefit or share of the, of the growth during the colonial economy. 
and, 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 and as you can see, that income terms for Indonesians were uh, pitiful in the, in the sense that they were much more poor in 1939 than they had been in 1921. Um, and, and so uh, this explains the, the kind of dislike uh, that a lot of Indonesians had with the colonial economy and the conditions uh, were ripe enough for the kind of approach that were taken in the post-colonial period uh, uh, in, the, in the effort to decolonize the economy. So um, we sort of sh we sort of skip the forties altogether. Uh, I want to discuss on the on the conditions of uh, of the old lama of the old order, um, which uh, of course is composed of two periods: the uh, democratic liberal period and the guided economy period uh, during the Sukarno period. Um, I want to I'm going to talk a little bit about the economic disadvantages of the post independence period. Uh, one very obvious uh, uh, problem was the destruction of transport infrastructure during the war, and this required uh, significant investment, which took very late in uh, coming because it required massive amounts of capital investment, which the new uh, Indonesian state just did not uh, have. Uh, second, which uh, which uh, related to what I've discussed uh, previously, was the very few capable administrators and managers. In fact. Um, over 17,000 Dutch civil servants, uh, which were on the upper management levels at, company, uh, at the uh, administrative level, were retained throughout the early 50s. And this was because there was absolutely no other choice. We also had a very tiny foreign reserve uh, by 1941, only uh, $142 million, um, which means that it only it can only pay for one year of import. Um, Another thing was that uh, uh, through the roundtable uh, agreement, uh, Indonesia was saddled with the, the financial economic agreement, which gave the debt of the Netherlands Indies uh, to the, the new republic. This was quite uh, uncommon, actually, amongst uh, post-colonial states to take over the debt of their colonial uh, states. Um, and then we can also see that the GDP uh, was much below uh, colonial level. Uh, the GDP of 1937 did return uh, in 1952, so it's quite uh, early uh, to return, but GDP per capita was, uh, is another uh, thing. Um, and then what, what we see is also uh, significant, uh, what Anne Luther has called structural retrogression. So the decline in the manufacturing share of the GDP from 12% in 1939 to just 7% in 1965. Now, um, as I've said, it, Indonesia uh, had late uh, uh, industrialization. Only through the end of the 30s did, we, did the Dutch government or the Dutch East Indies government actually implemented uh, kinds of necessary reforms for uh, industrialization. But then, even then, it, it, uh, throughout this period, it fell even further. So it became much smaller uh, to the total economy. Um, and it still maintained the dualistic economy of the colonial period. So the modern sector, which comprised of 25% of the GDP, was mostly under Dutch companies. And a lot of the export uh, for agriculture are still under the five large Dutch-owned Dutch, uh, uh, Dutch -owned companies, um, Internacio, Hafei Ai, and others, which would later on be uh, nationalized. Uh, wage growth in industry was well below the colonial period. Um, and importantly for the state, there was a contraction of tax base uh, throughout the 50s and 60s, the budget was on a deficit, except for 1951, uh, when there was a booming uh, export as a result of the Korean War. And um, government revenue is thus, because of the contraction of the tax base, we've relied increasingly on trade taxes, but also, importantly, on currency printing. And so, throughout the period, it was moderately high inflation, and then it became higher until uh, it reached high hyperinflation by the mid-60s. Um, looking at the parliamentary democracy period, uh, uh, the average growth rate was actually not so bad. Between 1950 and 1957, uh, it, it was on an average of 5%. A lot of this is rehabilitation uh, uh, growth rate. So because a lot of the uh, uh, factories were not uh, run or a lot of the plantations were not run during the 40s, what, what they had to do was quite minimal. They just had to make all these stuff work again, right? Um, and there was a significant, uh, relatively significant uh, number of per capita growth of 2% every year. What's interesting is that the 5% uh, growth rates 
of the 50s mimic the 5% growth rates of the post Suharto period. So it might be like a, demo, a democratic growth rates for Indonesia. Now by 1957, the GDP per capita uh, level reached its 1942 level. So uh, at that level, things seem to have uh, died down. So we sort of uh, returned, but that's only one part of the picture. On a lot of part, uh, a lot of the, uh, as you can see, st structural retrogression. And you have to also uh, think that GDP per capita here is using uh, the value of the money has has uh, been reduced. Um, economic rehabilitation uh, was difficult because of uncertainty of ownership and possible nationalization. So rehab of old uh, 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 stocks were, were, were conducted, but new investments were very tiny, almost non-existent. And a lot of the uh, major players in Indonesia, uh, Dutch-owned companies, they did not invest in new uh, ventures or did very few. In fact, uh, some of them focused on investing outside of Indonesia because of the, possible, of the possibility of nationalization. Um, uh, even though the uh, the I core rate is actually quite good, um, but of course there was uh, positive stuff. There's the development of indigenous ownership of the economy. Now this has its roots during the 30s, but uh, now in the 50s uh, the uh, government stepped in with the what's called the Benteng program, which sort of tried to push for increasing um, um, uh, increasing uh, participation of Indonesian within the national economy. But it also resulted in a lot of corruption and the Benteng program, well, some people consider it a, a failure. Others think that, well, it sort of spawned some few uh, um, companies which would later on continue to become uh, large national companies. Uh, another uh, significant uh, shift during this period was, was this gradual replacement of Dutch-owned businesses to, to Chinese-owned businesses. Uh, some indigenous-owned, but, but the, the, the major uh, takeover was by Chinese Indonesian owned businesses. And again, this is something which we can also see since the 30s, actually, or the 20s, in fact. There is an increasing uh, role played by Chinese owned businesses in, in the national economy or in the economy of the colonial uh, period. Um, now, the parliamentary democracy period ended in 57 and it ended with the nationalization of Dutch owned companies. Uh, and uh, so all of the Dutch companies were taken over. It was over 4,000, uh, 50,000 Dutch citizens were kicked out of Indonesia, and this uh, heralded the rise of uh, guided democracy and its guided economy. Now, the guided economy, of course, started, as, as I've said, um, as a result of the takeover of Dutch-owned companies in 1957. So this was um, a sudden nationalization. It was initially conducted by... Um, uh, leftist uh, uh, labor unions within these companies, but later on, uh, immediately it was then taken over by the army. So nationalization and takeover of Dutch-owned companies, it became state-owned companies, and most of it is under uh, the military, under the, uh, um, what was called the Badan Nasional Isasi. Um, you can see, I mean, they, this is a bit of a, of a uh, problem in, in counting uh, some people see uh, a steep output in decline, uh, which saw like uh, in 1958, uh, minus 3% growth. And this, according to the National uh, Planning Board, in fact, uh, they, they would uh, argue it was a much steeper uh, uh, GDP decline. But uh, calculations by Van der Eng actually uh, show that it's actually a positive growth rate that occurred during this period. Uh, and this in particular because of the, the spectacular growth of the oil sector. Uh, the, the oil sector was never nationalized, uh, or it was nationalized later on. The, uh, there's only one um, company that were nationalized, which is the Shell Oil Company. Um, and then later on, it would you know, be the route for the Pertamina. Um, uh, so this, is, this, this was to, to uh, so the early, init the initial guided economy period, uh, we have a mixed uh, picture. Um, accelerating inflation, so the, so a lot of the take the, as a result of the takeover of Dutch-owned companies, there was a reduction in export, um, and so um, and then of course Sukarno had a lot of uh, new projects with him as part of his uh, uh, international geopolitical uh, projects, and this had resulted in accelerating inflation because a lot of it was just uh, uh, rupiah being printed out. Um, 
uh, significantly was the collapse of the major multinationals, the major colonial multinationals, the Javier International, Intervis, Tokvis, and others. Uh, all these companies, uh, some of them died, others sort of shifted their um, business elsewhere. Hafea uh, invested a lot in, uh, in Ethiopia, but eventually they also got nationalized, I think, in the 60s. So uh, uh, basically all the major companies that were rooted in the colony, in the colonial period that uh, focused on plantation economies, they, they ended during this period. So in a way, the colonial economy ended. Um, Growth rates uh, of 1956, uh, sorry, 1958 to 1965 was around 1.7 percent, so significantly lower than uh, than uh, than 50 percent. Uh, and we had what was what was happening was a falling per capita income uh, of I think around 0.6 percent uh, per year during that period. So Indonesia became much poorer, and the economy uh, basically did not really grow that much throughout the the guided economy period. Um, and, and this is uh, significantly, um, uh, you can see this uh, difference uh, in comparison to peer economies. For instance, Malaysia at the time was growing at around 6% uh, a year. But, you know, not all things were negative. There were really significant positive developments, which I think uh, uh, is important in relation to understanding this shift, the rise in the, in the new order economy. Um, so one thing which which is quite uh, 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 significant was the expansion of education at all levels. Uh, so at, uh, at the primary, secondary, and tertiary uh, level, new universities were created. But also importantly, a lot of people were being sent abroad, especially to the United States, to uh, get their education, tertiary education. And, and so there was uh, a, a, a really uh, fast development uh, the creation of a new managerial elite. Um, and then, of course, uh, there, there's an expansion of capital ownership by Indonesian or Indonesian Chinese. So definitely what we're seeing is, is that during the 50s and 60s, the definitive shift from colonial economy to a national economy happened. So it's not it didn't happen in 45 because a lot of the, uh, a lot of the colonial companies continued in the 50s. So... Um, the economy of the new order is something quite new in, in that sense, at least in, in, in connection to capital ownership. Um, and then we have to also think of the various types of strong new institutions that were implemented throughout the 50s and 60s, which didn't exist uh, or which exist only minimally during the colonial period. So uh, institutions for national planning, institutions for economic data, for research, and so forth. And these were important in understanding then the developmental state model of the new order economy. So these aren't, they may not have worked as well during the, during the uh, guided democracy period, but they, uh, they would play a pivotal role in understanding the rise uh, of the new order economy later on. And plus there were also successful nationalizations in key sectors. Uh, in particular, I, I, I can see like the very successful uh, nationalization of the petroleum sector. Uh, so Indonesia basically, well, sort of nationalized the petroleum sector, uh, but it didn't really antagonize the West, uh, which I think was a success in comparison to what happened in, for instance, Iran, in which um, uh, the West then had to uh, uh, conduct some uh, uh, um, effort um, um, to uh, affect uh, domestic uh, political situation. Uh, and then, of course, the implementation of, of developmentalist uh, programs uh, occurred not during the new order, actually. So a lot of this, obviously, it has its use during the colonial period, as we've seen. But um, uh, there's, various far, far, there's various forms of, of developmentalist programs which were implemented, which were then continued during the new order period. So, there was a significant shift in, in state uh, society relations and significant shift in participation of Indonesian within that uh, state and within that uh, society. Um, so we can see in this, in this data uh, in connection to, um, uh, well, uh, in connection to innovation or in connection to growth, in connection to uh, uh, te technological growth, um, uh, of course, uh, again, the shift 
the the increasing uh, uh, developmental shift occurs during the 70s, and it, it was significant, as you can see, the, the growth rate, especially in the, if you include the oil and gas sector. Um, and one can then argue that the 50s and 60s was a failure, but I would argue that it was a period of developing the um, foundations that would allow for the sudden shifts in the in the late 60s and 70s. And this this is a graph on, on uh, total factor productivity, and sees uh, uh, that the 70s was much more productive. And afterwards, we, we, we come to a period that was much more productive than the colonial period. So it was so decolonization in that sense, uh, you know, although manifesting itself much more during the New Order period, we have to see that this this 50s and 60s, which were the nadir, the lowest part of the of of of, uh, in, of the innovative uh, strength of Indonesian economy, uh, as something which uh, uh, which build towards the, the rise of the 70s and 80s. And if you look at then again at the GDP per capita uh, level using uh, this one is calculated by Van der Eng, uh, um, uh, we can then see again that yes, the nadir of, uh, of it as well, of course, during the war, but, but uh, the, the 60s also saw a plunge in uh, a bit of a plunge in GDP per capita, but then a significant rise and constant rise, much higher than uh, um, than Indonesia had ever experienced during the colonial period, uh, to reach heights uh, that is still continuing uh, till today. So, uh, in that sense, um, uh, again, uh, the, the the ending of the colonial economy in the fifties and the, the the building up of of, uh, of institutions of institutional foundations. Really, I think is is key to understanding this constant rise in GDP per capita after uh, after the mid sixties. So um, to conclude uh, my uh, discussion, um, you know, and I, I guess it's uh, it would ask me asking me to discuss this in a space of twenty minutes. It's quite difficult, um, but let's just then to uh, see what kind of legacies can we think of uh, as as being important in this transitory period. Um, first of all, I think what's really important is that uh, the statutory period ended the colonial economy, and so we clearly shifted into new forms of, uh, you know, uh, new businesses that appeared, uh, new ownerships of capital, and so forth. And so a, a national economy can exist uh, afterwards. Um, secondly, I think uh, what's also important is that th this period uh, also resulted in the formation of a new managerial elite through the expansion of education and reorganization of state and business uh, administration. And this a new administration, new, uh, sorry, new man managerial elite is important for they would be the one that hold the levers of the new order economy. Um, yes, there is structural retrogression and there's a dip in economic development and income per capita. Indonesia definitely lagged behind its neighbors throughout the 20th century and we can, and this can, uh, be understood, you know, uh, easily because of the steep drop uh, of economic output, uh, of income per capita, and of GDP uh, during the uh, early two decades of Indonesia's uh, independence, which culminated in 1965 when the economy was at a nadir. Um, but again, uh, as I've said, there the the, the formation of the new institutional base for the for, uh, of a new institutional base for the new order state and economy is something that i think is is uh, important so we can see this as a sort of path dependent um uh, development on new forms of institutions that have uh, ramifications up till today and uh, i think we we should think of the legacies of this this two decade as not just a period of structural retrogression, but also institutional development. So in that sense, uh, we get a full picture and it's, it isn't just purely a negative, uh, uh, a negative uh, uh, a picture of the, of the period. So um, I would like to uh, stop my uh, discussion here. Thank you so much, Pafara Bifake.
That's very inspirational and also uh, great. And now we already have several questions from social media and also from the live chat of the YouTube. The first one is from Dias Baskoro. Bapak, what were the major sectors aside from oil and gas that made up a big portion in driving economic growth? Yeah, in the 50s, right? Um, well, actually, yeah. uh, uh, during the 50s, uh, a lot of the original colonial economy sort of returned. So remember, we were, uh, uh, some of the sectors never uh, returned. The, the sugar sector completely collapsed. And even today, we're still uh, one of the biggest sugar importers in the world, right? Whereas during the colonial period, we were one of the biggest sugar exporter in the world. Um, um, the sugar and some other uh, economies, uh, uh, sorry, uh, plantation sectors collapsed, but rubber was very strong. I think one, one very important uh, aspect is that a lot of the sectors that are strong in the outer islands remain strong because um, because of the structure. Uh, see, ownership in the outer island is owned by uh, a small holder, so people in the so people own their own plots of land, and they they, yeah. they were part of the and they had incentive to export. Uh, it's continues today, right? With the palm oil uh, export, for instance. Uh, whereas in Java, the sugar plantation economy was part of a feudal structure, in which uh, the uh, what do you call that? The workers were captured as part of the feudal structure. And so there was a lot of hatred towards sugar, for instance. So a lot. So for instance, in Yogyakarta, uh, all the sugar uh, mills were destroyed by by people during the revolutionary period, and they were never uh, rebuilt. Uh, and you can see why, though, because people hated being uh, slaves to the sugar sector. Uh, but the two major uh, uh, sectors that really propped up Indonesian economy at that period was uh, oil and uh, rubber, actually. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pak Farabifati. And we have uh, several other questions. The first one says, Bapak, how did the communist interested political agenda affect Indonesian production in the old order? Did it have like any viable economic weight? Hmm. Um, what do you yeah. think about it? Well, I mean, this is a difficult question, actually. First of all, yes. Uh, <laughs> The takeover of Dutch companies in 1957 was initiated by uh, um, labor unions, most of them uh, uh, related to leftist, so communist-related labor unions. But then they were immediately taken over by by, by military, by the army. Um, and during the 1960s, uh, there were efforts by the Sukarno government to implement uh, rehabilitation programs. A lot of it... Um, uh, what do you call that? Uh, involved communist. Uh, so there was increasing involvement in, com in communism. Um, um, what do you call that? Uh, input into the economy, but I, I, but it was never really implemented in a way because by that time the control was actually a lot. A lot of that economy was in control of, of, of army. Um, um, and uh, what was the question again? I forgot. Actually. Uh, basically. Uh... Did it have like any viable economic weight? Yeah, no, I think I don't think so. I think in the end, um, it was the policies of the Sukarno government that really, you know, in particular the takeover, the, uh, the uh, nationalization. Obviously, that was initial initiated by uh, the conditions, but Sukarno sort of made the atmosphere for that to occur. Oh, yeah, agree. It was very much a, a, a strong rhetoric against uh, Dutch presence. Um, and, uh, yeah, and, and by six, the economy was not doing very well anyway, so, yeah. Thank you, Bapak Harwi. And the last question, maybe we still have like a three minutes before we will move to the next sessions. This is from the uh, YouTube live chat. And what could we learn from the transitional period of the 1950 to the 1965 that might help us to survive the transition of economic precision during the pandemic? This is interesting because yes, <laughs> pandemic is very yes. current patients. This is from well, uh, Mas Aprisal Malali. <laughs> thank you, Mas Aprisal Malali. Well, you know the transitional uh, period is very long. Yeah? This occurred since 1945. <laughs> so, and the kind of destruction that occurred during this period was so significant. Uh, it 
you can also you can actually argue it started during the 1930 uh, the uh, what do you call it the depression. But what's basically what was happening was that there was a, a trend going down yeah. up to 1965, in which we became poorer and poorer, and there we became less uh, uh, less industrialized and so forth. Um, uh, whereas today, yeah, I, I I don't know because uh, first of all the COVID nineteen hasn't you know I don't know what the uh, maybe it'll it'll result in minus one percent growth rate for Indonesia so I, I think it might be less uh, and then uh, the question of course is what kind of structural effect it has because um, Indonesia was on an upswing I mean the, uh, after the post New Order period uh, of course there was deindustrialization but I guess in the last couple of years I think it, it, it was uh, a shift towards more of an industrialization. So I'm not so sure. I'm I actually I'm, I'm not so sure how, what we can learn actually in this context. Yeah, we we, we can learn that you know, um, we, f for the context of understanding the, the the transitional period of 50, 1965, is that we can learn just the varieties of that. You know, it's not simply uh, a, a period of of complete collapse, but there was important and significant uh, 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 institutional shift, and that's the important uh, lesson we can learn from. 50 to 65. Wow. Thank you so much, Pak Farabi Fake, for the great presentation. Yeah. It was really, really a pleasure to have you with us. And everyone, now we'd like to explore the topic of Indonesian economic during the new order or Orde Baru. We already have Bapak Professor Sidar Chandra. Professor Sidar Chandra is currently teaching economics in James Madison College at Michigan State University. And he is also the director of the Asian Study Center. It is one of the only two centers funded by the United States Department of Education as all Asian National Research Center. What a great thanks. He is also the president of the American Institute for Indonesian Studies or IFIS and the Midwest Conference on Asian Affairs. A member of the Finance Committee of the Association for Asian Studies and the Treasurer of the American Institute for the Indian Studies. Professor Chandra has a PhD in economics from Cornell University and also the economics from the University of Chicago and the BA with honors in economics from the Brandeis University. I believe that we all can wait to hear and get the knowledge from Professor Sida Chandra. So, Professor Sida Chandra, the time is yours. Uh, terima kasih, Gresika Bunga, and thank you to um, Otto Nordreven and uh, Alvincia Pramono and uh, all the officers of Permias for hosting uh, this very interesting event. I really enjoyed the previous talk. <laughs> uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop open my slideshow. Um, sure. Is it possible to put it on the screen? Yes. Thank you very much. Sure. I'm going to go to a full screen and start my presentation. So thank you very much, Gresika. Um, so I'm going to follow on this very interesting presentation by uh, uh, Farabi Faki. Um, I'm going to talk about the Indonesian economy during the new order uh, and then make a few observations at the end based on some of the material that's out there uh, that, that teaches us about the new order. So first and foremost, some of this may be material that a lot of you know if you're from Indonesia. We're talking about a time period that has a duration of about 1966 to 1998. It's bookended by two watershed events in Indonesian, uh, not just economic history, but political and, and sort of Indonesian history. The first is obviously the events of 1965, which some of you may know as Gerakan September Tigapulu, the assassination of six senior generals and one junior officer in the Indonesian army. The result is mass violence. About half a million people are estimated to have been killed. Um, and the result is a gradual power transition, what some people have called a creeping coup uh, by, by Suharto um, as he deposes um, Sukarno from power. And you have the introduction of authoritarian rule. And of course, the other bookend on the other side is the end of the Suharto regime, the new order. Um, and that's precipitated by the Asian financial crisis. Um, and it signals the beginning of a transition from an authoritarian regime to a democratic regime. Now, um, just by way of to give you an idea about what is coming, um, what we see during the order Baru is significant economic progress between 1966 and the, and the 1990s. Um, and some of that you saw in the graph that uh, uh, Dr. Um, uh, 
uh, Farabi Faki uh, uh, presented in, in his presentation. Um, what we had during the Order Baru period was very robust economic growth. And when I say greater than 5% per year, it was actually significantly more. There were phases of sustained economic growth, often almost a decade long, of 7%, and occasionally growth actually went above 10% a year. So this is really phenomenal growth. And, sorry, Patendra. Yes. Uh, we'd like to show your uh, presentation, but uh, would you please to help us to uh, represent it? Ah, OK. Can you see it? Thank you. Yes, we can see it clearly. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And, uh, and uh, let me go to the full screen. And can you tell me whether you still see it? Uh, sorry, Papa. Maybe you just can like uh, go to the previous mode. Because in Understood. OK. Mode, yes. So, so, so I, much, I'll Papa. stay in this mode. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and let me, maybe I should zoom in a little more then, because the slides will be a little bit bigger that way. Yeah. OK. So um, uh, we have the Order Baru. It's bookended by two major historical events. We see significant economic progress between 1960 uh, and 1990s, uh, very rapid economic growth, uh, uh, well above 5% per year on average. And of course, accompanying it are, are the very happy um, uh, uh, the increase in a variety of indicators of standard of living. So from education to health to per capita income, three of the things that development economists like myself look at all the time, we see very significant improvements in it. So overall, this is a very happy time, uh, at least economically, uh, for Indonesia. Um, I'd like to read, uh, before I move into a, a little bit of a closer look at the order Baru and, and a co comparison with order Lama, um, this is a quote from one of the most eminent economists of the uh, New Order. Uh, his name was Mohammed Sadli. This is a name you may have heard. Uh, he's quoted in a book by Professor Hal Hill, another uh, towering figure in the study of the economy of Indonesia. And he says, when the New Order government came in, it abolished the extensive price controls of the old regime. So the Sukarno regime, the Order Lama, was marked by a variety of interventions in the economy um, that were partly responsible for some of the weak economic performance that you saw in the previous presentation. And uh, the new order government came in, it abolished the extensive price controls of the old regime because it wanted to rely on the price mechanism for the allocation of resources. Those of you who have studied economics, you know exactly what I mean. If you have not, I'm happy to explain it at the end of the presentation. Such is still the ruling policy, but old habits die hard. One of the economic doctrines of the new order is that it is against free fight competition. So while some marketization, some introduction of market mechanisms to the, into the economy was embraced by the new order, it didn't go full scale into opening um, the economy up in, into, a, into a market. So such is still the ruling policy, but old habits die hard. One of the economic doctrines of the new order is that it is against free fight competition because the latter is too much identified with capitalism, which even the new order cannot embrace. So um, I'm going to be talking about a time of great change in Indonesia. But you must remember that were, there were significant elements of continuity as well that were coming over from Order Lama into Order Baru. Okay. Um, so let me start by very briefly giving you an overview of political change. We have the old order from about 1945 to 1965. We saw that in the previous presentation. We have the new order from 1966 to 1998. Um, you have a major political change in, after 1965. Uh, and a very important part of it that was very briefly alluded to in the previous presentation was the elimination of the Indonesian Communist Party. Now, the PKI was a very influential political force, especially in the late 1950s and early 1960s in Indonesia. And as you heard in the previous presentation, it actually influenced economic policy in a significant manner. Okay, So the elimination of the PKI uh, results in the elimination of, of a lot of these socialist, communist, command economy type forces in economic policy. And when Suharto stripped Sukarno finally of, of power uh, in 1966 on the 11th of March through Super Samar, what you have is the, the opening up of a gap uh, for a major changes in policy in the Indonesian economy. Um, in addition, um, this is a time when Indonesia is distancing itself from China and the Chinese Communist Party, which was very close to the PKI in, uh, prior to 1965. And you have the emergence of the pro-Western Indonesian army 
and Golkar, which is the civilian ally of the Indonesian army. Okay, so that's what's going on politically. Um, now, what does this mean ideologically? Because ideology is what ultimately ends up feeding into policy. We see a significant change post-1965. We see the opening up of ideological space to adopt some market-oriented policies while still maintaining some socialist aspects. So we've inherited a heavily socialist economy. It's now opening up in some areas um, uh, to become a more market-oriented economy. What does Soharto do? Um, he says, uh, and, and this again reaches back into the previous presentation, um, the creation of sort of a technocratic, um, you know, a cadre of, of young, uh, in those days, young Indonesians who are sent to study in the West, in, in the US and in European universities. They come back with their training and they're ready to apply them to the economy. And this watershed political moment actually opens the space to introduce that expertise into the management of the economy. And so you have the introduction of a team of economic technocrats, uh, sometimes called the Berkeley Mafia. You may have heard this. A lot of them were educated at the University of California in Berkeley. They include, um, again, towering figures of the early Indonesian, uh, the New Order economy, Vijoyo Niti Sastro, Mohammed Sadli, Emil Salim, Subroto, Ali Vardana, and many, many others. Okay. Um, now, what happens as a consequence is, first of all, there are a number of socialistic aspects of the old order policy that are de-emphasized. Perhaps the most important one is the basic agrarian law of 1960. This was a law that basically required that farmland, uh, the amount of land that a single individual could own of farmland would be limited. There would be a ceiling on it. And this was politically a very, very fraught policy. It was a fraught policy because there were many people who owned a lot of land who didn't want to give it up. And you had the uh, Communist Party of Indonesia, a major affiliated organization of which was Barisan, who were typically poor, sometimes landless, sometimes small land holding farmers who said, you know, we would really benefit from having a little more land on which to farm. OK, uh, in fact, uh, for those of you who have studied Indonesian history during Order Lama and Order Baru, uh, this land reform agrarian law was one of the one of the laws that led to the phenomenon of Aksi Sapihak which really started pitting um, some political groups within Indonesia against each other. Aksi Sapiak being the forcible appropriation of land um, with the justification that the law was passed, nobody's doing anything about it, let's take the law into our own hands. Okay, So, so when the order Baru comes in, Suharto lacks a civilian political base. He's, he's basically, he's a major general, right? And... Um, uh, so, so what they do in terms of their ideology is they start promoting economic progress as being a center point of their, their political ideology and as a potentially as a basis for their political legitimacy. And this is led on the civilian side by Golkar and obviously the Indonesian army through the Dwi Fungsi philosophy, which is developed later on. And that is basically, in addition to being the caretakers of the national security, uh, the army also has an official role in social and economic development in Indonesia. Okay, let me move on. And just to emphasize this, unfortunately, the image is small, but for those of you who ever held a 50,000 rupiah note from uh, the late Suharto regime, if you look at what's written here, it says Suharto Bapa Pambangunan Indonesia. Okay, so this is a very clear statement of economic development as being part of the political legitimacy of the new order regime. Okay. So let me talk a little bit about the economic chronology of the new order. Um, uh, the economy that um, uh, the Order Baru inherits from the Order Lama is really in tatters. It's in a terrible situation, a uh, very high inflation. The inflation has been caused basically by the government printing money in order to finance the massive deficits that it's running. And if you just print money uh, indiscriminately, you're going to have very high inflation. Now, that brings about all kinds of other economic distortions. I don't have the time to go into them. It also actually contributes, if you, if you have high enough inflation, to a lowering of the, the rate of economic growth. Okay, So the first job of these technocrats, these economic technocrats, is to bring inflation under control. And it turns out it's not a very difficult job. They just recognize that this is a problem and it needs to be done. And they start implementing measures for macroeconomic stabilization. Now, up into the early 1970s, um, they've brought inflation under control and the economy has started growing very rapidly. Now, part of the reason it grows very rapidly is it has fallen extremely rapidly in the five or six years preceding 1965. So it's growing off a relatively low base, 
And a lot of the economic potential that was lost in the previous five years is regained during the early New Order era. Okay. Now, by the time we reach 1974, uh, another major event in economic history of the world, <clears throat> oil prices, they quadruple. And Indonesia is in the very fortunate situation of being a net oil exporter. And this provides massive windfall gains um, uh, from these very high oil prices. And this it's almost a decade, about seven years of this benefit accrues to the Indonesian economy. Uh, by and large, this windfall is well managed. There are aspects of mismanagement through Pertamina, which is the major oil company. But by and large, this is well managed. And in fact, a lot of this windfall gain is invested into uh, sectors of the economy like education and health, thereby benefiting um, the broader Indonesian population. Now, unfortunately, in 1982, the oil price starts declining and we actually end up in a situation of oil glut. And this is a time. This is a time of real belt tightening for the Indonesian economy because it has got used the policy makers to all these revenues, tax and other revenues, and all of a sudden they disappear. So um, this is a period of belt tightening and reformulation of, of of economic strategy for Indonesia. And the next stage in in the new order, uh, the history of the new order is what I call, in some ways, it's the final stage. It's the last decade of the new order. And this is when Indonesia is adjusting to the fall in the price of oil. They can no longer rely on oil for a lot of the revenues. And they start diversifying economically into manufacturing. Okay, So they deregulate the economy. They financially liberalize it. And they start focusing on uh, manufacturing and, I, and the production of exports, manufactured exports. Okay, um, I should say that this financial liberalization is unfortunately also responsible in part for the severity of the 1998 Asian crisis that brings the Suharto, the New Order regime to the end. But I can't go into that. We don't have enough time. All right. So let me talk a little bit about the comparison between the new and the old order. I mentioned some very important discontinuities, political, ideological, and in terms of policy. Uh, let me talk a little bit more about these discontinuities. So let me emphasize them in this slide. Number one is starting 1965-66, uh, you move from a regime which is telling the West, you know, go to hell with your aid and all of that, and we're going to impose strongly socialist policies, to one in which the economic orthodoxy of the time, which is driven by a sort of more market-oriented ideology, is increasingly embraced by, by Indonesian policymakers. Um, macroeconomic management, uh, a complete shift away from printing money to finance deficits to inflation control, which is the opposite. Okay. Another very interesting development, and this is kind of contrary to market principles, is the growth of the government budget. In the first five years, uh, actually about the first 10 years of the, of the new order, the, the growth of the, gov the government budget expands from 10% to 25% of GDP. Okay, So you actually have the expansion of government um, as a possible stabilizer for the economy in the early part of the, uh, of the new order. And then a final major change from the uh, old order, from Order Lama, is the international openness of the of Indonesia. So there's a transition to manufactured exports. Uh, there's an increasing Asia orientation in the exports. So you see the rise of Japan, and then later on the beginnings of the rise of China and other countries in Asia in the trading uh, uh, volume, in the trade volume uh, of Indonesia. And the other big change is um, Indonesia uh, becomes uh, takes on a lot of aid in order to finance the early aspects of, of its development in the new order. So there's a lot of World Bank involvement in financing some of the development in Indonesia during the new order. Um, structural transformation. This is a time of enormous structural transportation uh, transformation. It's really the time when Indonesia transitions from being predominantly agricultural. Uh, so, so the share of agriculture and GDP declines. Of course, it's accompanied by rapid intensification of agriculture. So, so productivity in agriculture actually increases very rapidly, more rapidly than a lot of other um, similar Asian economies. We see the rapid expansion of industry and services as a share of GDP. Um, and then towards the later um, New Order era, when oil prices fall, we see a very concerted transition from extractive industries, so we're going to pull something out of the ground and sell it, uh, to manufacturing industry. Um, so we are actually going to add value to raw materials within Indonesia and then, and then sell it. 
Uh, and then finally, manufacturing and especially services become increasingly important drivers of, of employment uh, in the late new order Indonesia. Okay, so this is a picture. This shows you very clearly what's happening. Um, in uh, 1965, 50% of Indonesia's GDP, over 50% is in agriculture. And by 1996, towards the end of the, the new order, it's only 16%. Services and industry have taken up the rest. All right. Uh, social indicators, and I think this may be one of my last slides because we're running out of time. Um, we see a dramatic decline in poverty, both in terms of total numbers and, of course, as a result, in, in, in terms of the percentage of the population because the population itself is growing. Dramatic rise in educational attainment. Primary enrollment rises from 72% at the beginning of the new order to 115% at the end. Uh, improvement in health, life expectancy shoots up from 40 years in 1960 to 63 years if you're a man and 67 if you're a woman, new order. Um, the one area in which Indonesia does not make improvements is inequality. So even though everybody is rising, the gaps between the rich and the poor um, are, are maintained. So here's the summary. During the new order, the Indonesian economy performed very, I, I shouldn't have just said well, I should have said very well. It really did very well. Um, in the early years, the focus was stabilization. Uh, the, almost the entire period of the new order was marked by robust growth. There was one exception in the 1980s when the oil prices fell and there was some belt tightening. But Indonesia rapidly pulled out of that and, and started moving up on its uh, pre-oil um, price fall uh, trajectory. Um, and then there were significant improvements in the standard of living. Uh, there are some caveats to this if we want to start kind of picking some, you know, fall. Um, number one, we have the green GDP problem. So a lot of Indonesia's growth was actually financed by pulling oil out of the ground and selling it and then bringing that money into Indonesia and investing it or consuming it, right? So we, we, can, we can think about this as basically conversion of environmental capital into either consumption or into some other form of capital. And I would say both of those occurred in Indonesia. So there was investment in education, which is conversion of oil, environmental capital, into human capital, which can also be productive. But there was also consumption. Um, a second is a uh, part of Indonesia's performance was driven by a generous aid from the West. There's no question about it. Although poverty fell, inequality did not decline. And of course, the regime itself was marked by fairly severe political repression. Uh, and for those of you who were alive during the time, also a, a lot of crony capitalism, which I think was all the more visible because um, you, you had a, a very strongly centralized and authoritarian regime with Suharto at the center. And so most crony capitalist relations actually flowed down from Suharto. So it was quite visible uh, in New Order Indonesia, the, the system of crony capitalism. And then finally, I'd like to recommend if you're interested in Indonesia's economic history, of course, you can look up journals and read articles. But these are three books that I found to be very good summaries of Indonesia's economic history. The first two actually start in the colonial era and come all the way up to uh, uh, the late 20th century. The third one actually looks uh, much more uh, specifically at the new order. So for those of you who are interested, please take a look at these books. I think you'll find them interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bapak. Wow, what a super insightful presentation from Pak Sidarta Chandra. A lot of interesting information include the mission of Bapak Pembangunan Indonesia in our 50,000 rupiah. Wow. <laughs> Bapak, now we already have several questions. The first one is from Calvin Kurniawan. How big and important is the impact of the emergence of large business conglomerates in the economy during the new order? I mean, like this is the Suharto affiliated or not? Yeah, um, I think the conglomerates were, were very important in a way. Um, so, um, you know, uh, uh, crony capitalism, right? How does it function? I mean, you, you, have to, you have to think about the regime. The regime is an authoritarian and centralized regime, right? And part of the goal is to maintain control over economic uh, uh, aspects of uh, uh, over the economy as well, right? So, so uh, uh, I, I think a very convenient form, organizational form, uh, in authoritarian regimes is the crony capitalist form of uh, of um, uh, of control, right? So, I think the the conglomerates in Indonesia that emerged during the new order, 
the reflections of this crony capitalist form of organization where you had at the top who was the political power and there were there were sort of a selected if you will group of people who were allowed access to different sectors of the economy and of course became incredibly wealthy as a consequence but also uh, very clearly uh, did the bidding of the president right now on the on the uh, on the negative side to the extent that some of these conglomerates were allowed to monopolize different sectors of the economy uh, as any economist will tell you monopoly is generally a very bad thing there are very few situations in which economy uh, monopoly is actually good so i would say that had a very detrimental impact uh, on indonesia but on the other hand i think it it did allow the authoritarian regime to maintain control and therefore provide an element of political stability to indonesia and that political stability i think was helpful in attracting investment into indonesia is that angle as well you know you may not like a dictator if you're living under his rule but uh, you know if you're an investor and you're looking for stability sometimes dictators look like a good bet thank you so much pa we also have question from ba febrina pramaswari hi when our oil resource brought a great economic growth and then it fell down can we say indonesia shifted from the semi periphery to the periphery pa uh, i personally don't think so in in fact uh, you know that's a very good question so so when 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 oil when the price of oil fell and indonesia's exports were perhaps not that important in the broader portfolio of goods and services that are traded in the world india uh, indonesia did briefly become a little more peripheral but what did indonesia do as a consequence right indonesia diversified into manufacturing exports and i think performed quite well on the back of those manufactured exports and that pulled it right back into i think its former position but in a much more balanced and i think economically healthier manner so so you know for for a very short period of time indonesia may have become a little more peripheral in the global trading system but i think it bounced right back uh, um due to some of the policies that were implemented the financial liberalization massive you know domestic investment that started going into industry that allowed it to to diversify its manufacturing base get it get it out wow and um, from mas dias baskoro Bapak, what were some of the key policies employed that proved to be effective to rein in inflation? Um, so th there were a, there were a number of different policies. So so one was uh, you know very basically it was to stop printing money to finance the deficit. You know, um, you know if yeah. I run a deficit, if if I you know if if I spend more than I I'm receiving in terms of taxes, if I'm the government, there are different ways. to to kind of cover the deficit one is i'll say i just go to the, the printing press and say let's start printing out rupiah right yeah, that's okay. what order lama was doing that yeah. that was stopped they started financing the deficit using other mechanisms uh, so that was number one number two uh, even though they didn't strictly adhere to it they did start implementing policies that they called balanced budget policies <laughs> they weren't really balanced budget policies there were ways around it but i think they were much more effective in doing that and i think i think we can owe this uh, we can thank the the technocrats that suharto brought in to stabilize the economy for for taking all these measures so karno did not have that kind of support he had inherited an indonesia that was basically colonial that did not have that kind of human capital but uh, suharto inherited an indonesia that actually had returnees now who were well trained and could take care of some of these economic problems yeah bapa and maybe this is uh, another question from mbak nadia amalia hi professor how our current more decentralized system and ongoing tensions between indonesia diverse regions influence our economic performance and what could we learn from new order centralized system yeah so you know this is a this is a very difficult question a uh, question that not only indonesia faces you know i'm originally from india and india india in some ways has a similar history to indonesia these are very large countries they are culturally very diverse countries they are linguistically very diverse countries right and one of the problems that faced sukarno and the early leadership of indonesia was the same problem that faced nehru and the early leadership of india and that is 
now that our you know the colonial rulers with their big armies and their guns have gone how do we hold the country together right um so um uh, I personally think that decent economic decentralization, along with political decentralization, that gives everybody a voice, a true voice, uh, uh, can be a very healthy thing for a country. I think that generally speaking, um, you start having problems when there are elements of the population, maybe some province, if you're Indonesia, or some state, if you're India, if people start feeling disenfranchised and feel like they don't have a voice and a way. To be heard and to play a role and and take a sort of partake of the development of the economy, that's when you start to have problems. So per se, I, I I think that I think that decentralization can be very beneficial. I think that you have to have a political system that uh, manages that decentralization by allowing the voice and and giving people the benefits of the decentralization uh, and also embracing them as part of the the larger polity. And th these are struggles that any big and diverse country faces. But I don't think it needs to affect the economy, if that's your original question. Well, I think you can do well economically and still be decentralized. Yes. Well, uh, Professor Sudachandra, we still have like several interesting questions. The first one is from Magisa Afria or Asia. Uh, did the increase in human capital development also encourage increased women labor in participation in Indonesia? Uh, absolutely. No question. No. There's no question. <laughs> Um, and there is another angle to this, actually. Let, let me mm -hmm. go into it just a little bit. You know, I, I'm sitting here in Michigan in the United States. Yeah. And of course, over here, participation of women in the labor force is, is even higher than it is in Indonesia, right? And, and you have to ask the question, why? Well, as an economy develops, it moves from a situation of having surplus to one in which labor actually starts becoming scarce, right? And when labor starts becoming scarce, even if you have gender imbalances to begin with, let's say you're in a world in which only the men are working to begin with. When labor starts getting scarce, right, then the economy automatically starts opening its doors to, to elements of the labor force that might otherwise have been excluded, right? And so I, I think that what's been happening in Indonesia is the demand for relatively educated labor has been going up quite uh, rapidly over the past few decades. And so I think women who are uh, more educated have already been pulled into the economy, especially in the more urbanized sectors. In rural sectors, women have always been part of the economy, whether they've been counted or not. The role that they play is, is tremendous. So, so um, uh, I think the increase in human capital development has definitely encouraged increased uh, labor participation by women. I think it will continue. I think so long as, and I hope that this will always be the case, Indonesia keeps growing rapidly, this will only, uh, this will only uh, uh, grow. And at some point, I think women will be much more equal economically to men uh, than perhaps they are when they were years ago. OK, Papa, what a super uh, insightful. But uh, would you please to give us like the closing statement about the Ordebaro economic part? So, you know, as, as somebody who's interested in history, and I've also studied the events of 1965, which obviously are very controversial in Indonesia, to say two things. Uh, I, I think that the Order Baru had a very positive side to it that was economic. I think politically it was a lot more problematic. I like to think that everybody should have a voice and sort of, you know, a, a, some kind of be listened to. Um, so that's one issue. The the other thing that I think um, I, I hope that some of you in the audience or somebody else will take up is if you look at the structure of these talks right now, um, uh, the uh, uh, Professor Faki Farabi Faki talked about Order Lama, and he stopped in 1965. I talked about Order Baru, and I started in 1966. Very few people have focused on what happened in 1964, 65, and 66. And if, if, as we all agree, I think there was massive economic dislocation at the time because of what was going on, you know, the violence and so on, somebody needs to study what was happening to the economy at that time, right? Nobody has done that. So I, I hope that some economists will look at what's happening in that transition period and maybe write a book on it as well. I haven't seen that yet. It's not in any of those three books that I, I put on the list. They, they all have a big gap. So some, 
preferably an Indonesian should fill that gap. <laughs> <laughs> Oke okay, Bapak Farabi, Pak Bapak uh, Sidar Kecandra, it's very very luar biasa Bapak is very extraordinary and uh, thank you so much Pak Sidar Chandra for the great presentation. It was really a pleasure to have you with us and we will have couple minutes breaks. Don't go anywhere because at 9:30 uh, we will have another special session with Bapak Faisal, Faisal Basri to explore the topic of Indonesian energy and mineral industries. And, and, and please thank, yes, may I thank Permias. Thank you so much for organizing Bapak. this. Uh, you are an amazing organization. We have a chapter here at Michigan State University. Every every Bapak. time I see my Permias thank friends, it makes me really happy. So thank you very much. Pak Chandra, thank you so much. We're really happy to have you. And everyone, in the break session, we also proudly present to you Berkeley Indonesian Ensemble. Please enjoy your break session.
将。Wow! Thank you very much. Very, very beautiful and calming tones from the Berkeley Indonesian Ensemble. And everyone, I would also like to promote the Premias merch. Please check the link here. You can do a pre-order at Bitly slash Premias slash merch. This is a very, very uh, great hoodie, baseball caps. Tote bag, and you can find uh, them at Promias Merch. Yeah, thank you very much, dear ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Warikada by Promnias National United States of America, the economic path of a nation. As I promised, now we're going to explore the topic of Indonesian energy and mineral industries. With us, we already have Bapak Faisal Basri, an Indonesian economist and politician. He basically completed his Master of Arts degree in economics at Vanderbilt University, Nashville, Tennessee, United States of America in the year of 1988. And he started his career as a lecturer at the Faculty of Economics and Business, University of Indonesia for the course in political economy, international economics, development economics, and history of economics. So, he is one of the founders of the Institute of the Development of Economics and Finance, or we can uh, say that in depth, from 1995. In the governmental sector, Pak Faisal Basri also a member of the World Economic Development Team under the second assistant coordinating minister of the economic affairs and member of the presidential assistance team for economics affairs in 2000s. So, Everyone, let's welcome together Bapak Faisal Basri. Halo Bapak, selamat, selamat pagi, pagi juga Bapak. Indonesia. Selamat malam <laughs> in US. We really glad to have you with us today Bapak. <laughs> Sehat yes, Bapak? Itu. Alhamdulillah baik. Alhamdulillah. Uh, how to share screen? Uh, our team will, can help. Okay, Bapak. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Bapak. Can I uh, operate by myself? Yes, you can operate by uh, yourself or we can help you too as well. Okay, uh, <laughs> let you uh, help me to, 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 to show the, the, the presentation. Thank you, Bapak. So everyone, we proudly present to you Bapak Faisal Basri. The time is yours, Bapak. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good evening in US. Good uh, morning in Jakarta. Uh, I just would like to share with you two subtopics. Uh, firstly, uh, energy sectors, and secondly, uh, mineral resources uh, sectors. Uh, next, please. Next, uh, okay, uh, the relationship between economic growth and population growth uh, with uh, primary energy uh, consumptions uh, is very, very, very strong. You can see here uh, countries with uh, very low growth and low population growth uh, consume less and less energy uh, and Indonesia uh, in other side you see here we have uh, 
average five years uh, GDP growth and still positive uh, population growth uh, has uh, high uh, uh, energy consumption. So if we continue uh, uh, grow uh, with relatively high growth, we have to uh, prepare uh, our energy supply to fulfill the, the the need for 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 all sectors to consume enough energy next okay here indonesia you see the rate of growth uh, average of growth 2008 until 2018 uh, uh, was 5% and last year increase uh, more than double to 8.3 percent this is from consumption side next please we are very very low uh, consumption energy compared to many countries yeah uh, just higher compared to uh uh philippines and uh vietnam with philippines and vietnam and so we start with very low level energy consumption that's why you can expect we will have uh uh, uh, uh <coughs> we will have uh, uh, a sharper uh, uh, shape in the next future so the increase will be much higher compared to others because we we start with very low level please uh, next in other side uh, from production uh, 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 side our reserve is getting lower and lower and just one uh, 2.5 billion uh, barrel in 2019 next please and compare with other our neighboring countries china india vietnam and malaysia indonesia is the only country facing a declining trend from time to time you know from this level to just 2.5 uh, billion so in other countries like china uh, uh, there is uh, uh, the reserve uh, uh, is increasing from time to time at least other other country at least uh, stable uh, 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 level next please similar to gas uh, reserve uh, uh, tend to uh, uh, decrease and drop uh, last year only 1.54 uh, trillion cubic meters equivalent to 21.2 years so it, uh, in the next 21 years, uh, our guess will finish. If we cannot uh, 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 find the new uh, 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 reserves. Next, please. Coal, uh, we are not the biggest or five biggest uh, producers. Our reserves is only uh, 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 our reserve is only three point four uh, percent of the total uh, world reserve, and okay, we 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 can uh, uh, get until uh, nine uh, 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 sixty five years from now on. But if you look at next. But if you look at to the uh, share of export, you see here we contribute uh, uh, a quarter 
uh, in terms of uh, uh, world export volume, but our research is only 3.7%. So we exploit a very huge amount of uh, coal compared to our uh, reserves. So it 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 it, it, it will create you know uh, depletion in very very high speed uh, 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 pace. Next, please. If we uh, make projection until two thousand fifty, you can see both uh, uh, oil and gas reserve is like this and it's not 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 this production is like this so uh, we will not have uh, enough uh, production to match the, the the energy consumption in the near future and then in 2050 cetris paribus uh, we have to import most of our need uh, 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 for gas and uh, uh, oil. Next, please. So this is the gap. This is the uh, consumption you uh, uh, see already. The trend is very, very uh, 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 sharp here. Uh, and uh, the production is like this and last year the gap is almost 1 million barrel per day please remember the gap is 1 million close to 1 million uh, barrel per day and we have to import the gap yeah next please okay the next we don't have enough time to do that. We don't have time to 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 show all. Uh, so let's start with uh, our trade balance of crude oil. This is export and uh, 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 below uh, 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 zero is imports. You know, and uh, the uh, black line is the, the 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 surplus of the deficit here deficit all the time from 2013 so we are already net importers of crude oil okay next please how about oil product oh the situation is worse because you see here uh, 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 our export is very small, but we import more and more oil product. Why uh, in the last uh, two years, the, the, the balance, uh, the, the deficit is uh, smaller because we already use the alternative energy. Uh, we call it uh, biofuel we use our cpo to produce uh, uh, alternative energy non uh, uh, fossil energy but you know in terms of the overall uh, trade balance uh, biofuel doesn't help the uh, our total trade deficit because we uh, 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 sacrifice our uh, potential export from TPO. So, okay, we, we are getting better in terms of uh, 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 oil uh, uh, deficit, but lower oil, uh, uh, lower uh, total export. So, the net impact is zero in terms of uh, uh, trade balance uh, of Indonesia. Next, please. We are still uh, 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 
Oh, this is the total oil, uh, 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 crude and uh, oil product. So the 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 the, the deficit is like as uh, oh, close to 20 20 billion US dollar. Uh, don't see uh, the last two uh, uh, data because it's, it's only until August. But the trend is similar. Uh, next, please. Fortunately, we uh, still have uh, uh, surplus in our gas uh, here, but the surplus is getting uh, less and less, but still surplus. Next, please. This is oil and gas, total oil and gas. Uh, the deficit is, of course, getting uh, uh, less because the contribution of gas is still positive. Next, please. Hopefully, we have... Uh, uh, surplus, big surplus in coal. We uh, don't uh, import coal. Uh, we, we import very, very small. So we can uh, use export as the proxy of trade balance. So this is uh, 375 uh, million uh, tons in terms of volume and this one in terms of value. So the total energy, uh, oil, gas, and coal, please, next. Okay, so we are surplus, still surplus, but very uh, low, very low, and starting from 2021, meaning next year, we predict our energy will start to be deficit. So starting uh, 2021, because of pandemic, pandemic uh, COVID-19, maybe the deficit will start uh, later 2022, two years from now on. Next, please. But, you know, in 2040, the deficit, energy deficit of Indonesia will touch the very, very high number, approximately 80 billion US dollar. 80 billion US dollar, or equivalent to 4% of GDP. So, if we... Uh, uh, do business as usual, we will be in trouble because we cannot reach higher level of growth because we don't have enough energy, we don't have enough money to import our energy needs. So this uh, uh, situation I call it energy, uh, crisis energy di depan mata. Next, please. So this one is energy mix, you know. Uh, huge difference between government version and uh, British Petroleum Statistical Review of World Energy. Government claim uh, last year, uh, the contribution of uh, renewable energy uh, was 9.15%. But according to definition of British Petroleum Statistical Review of Energy, only, oh my God, it's missing here, uh, only uh, one point something percent. I forgot the, or oh, oh, 4%, uh, let's say 4%. Uh, it miss here. I'm sorry. Uh, so it's to uh, 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 this is uh, this is the issue of definition. Maybe the government put uh, 
other uh, 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 energy source claim as uh, renewable. Next, please. Okay, this one is the uh, our refining capacity uh, has been uh, has an uh, increase in the last 20 years. This is the, the capacity. The actual uh, 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 production is not uh, as uh, high as this because uh, most of our uh, refining uh, refinery. Uh, 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 are very old, uh, 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 frequently uh, damaged because uh, old and we have to repair and so on and so forth. And now the government uh, launched uh, big projects, consists of four RDMP project and two new refineries. Of course, the cost is very high. The investment cost is very high, 20 to 40 billion US dollar. But at the same time, the government is rushing to realize uh, uh, program B30, biofuel 30, so 30% 30 of the uh, biodiesel uh, uh, consists of uh, FAME or uh, CPO base. Uh, or and B40 and even you know B100 program. The ambition at the same time, the ambition is to develop uh, massively the electric car industry, supported by ambitions to become the largest battery producer in the world. Yeah, Minister, Minister of uh, Energy SDM, Pak Yonan, uh, declare. Uh, uh, Indonesia will be no more conventional car production by 2040. But until now, there is no refinery integrated with the petrochemical industry and vice versa. So, if the government implement all this project, there will be chaotic uh, situation if everything is to be realized and will result in very high economic cost. Please, next. This is the price of gasoline. Uh, this is the uh, uh, golden momentum for us to eliminate RON88 or premium. We know it as premium and pertilite uh, RON90 or 89 to uh, enter the new era of you know uh, blue sky uh, and uh, environmental friendly uh, 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 gasoline we have to push this uh, post in post pandemic era next please so the biofuel is not the solution one of the goals of biofuel development is to reduce oil imports so as to improve current account deficit. The reality is just the opposite, you know, based on the calculation, based on uh, using opportunity cost. It actually, as I said before, resulted in trade deficit. 20 trillion rupiah uh, in 2018 and 85 Point two trillion in 2019. So biofuel is not the solution. Palm oil farmers are the very disadvantaged because the selling price of uh, palm oil at the farmer level is dropped. Subsidies is not gone, yeah, because subsidies uh, shift from fuel to biofuel. So it will continue burden our budget. And this is the most serious one. It takes an additional 5 million hectares of land to realize uh, B30, B40 programs in 2045. This is based on the study done recently by uh, LPM, uh, University of Indonesia. Next, please. 
Oh, we have a lot of uh, uh, ambitions, and the other ambition is to uh, uh, to uh, push city gas for uh, household. It needs to be realized, you know, that our natural gas and gas resource, natural oil uh, and gas resources are uh, shrinking and therefore must be utilized optimally. People do not care what energy supply they get. What is important for them is availability, reliability, and affordable price. Nearly now, 100% of people have enjoyed electricity. What is city gas for? So we have to prioritize uh, gas for industry to improve the competitiveness of our industry. Next, please. Next, please. Okay, now we start with nature, uh, 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 political economy of uh, mineral resources. Uh, 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 our coal production controlled by the six uh, biggest uh, companies. Yeah, uh, the share of these six. Uh, companies uh, is 70 percent of our national production most of them will end the contract uh, near soon so uh, they have to uh, give back the concession to the government and uh, in first term of jokowi era minister of uh, state on enterprise would like to give this uh, uh, land, this concession to state on enterprise. So they are very angry. They do everything uh, they can to lobby the government, to lobby our parliament, to make sure they will uh, continue uh, uh, the control of land already uh, 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 have and no uh, extension needed uh, based on the new uh, 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 mineral and coal minerba we call mineral and coal uh, uh, low uh, enacted uh, uh, recently uh, they don't uh, they cannot wait anymore uh, the uh, what we call it Omnibus law, cipta kerja, or uh, job creation. Uh, before the law, they uh, put the, their own their their own agenda in the draft law of uh, omnibus law. So they uh, uh, tried very hard, and they are very successful uh, to maintain uh, their control in uh, uh, coal production. Next, please. So the coal production uh, 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 increased very sharply in the last five years. Every election year, year, election year increase uh, 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 with a higher uh, uh, level, higher growth, you know. Uh, because they have to give money, of of course, to the politicians, to the candidates, you know, uh, uh, and they create actually a kind of uh, oligarchy uh, a power uh, 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 in exchange uh, to give, uh, in exchange to hold the, the concession, they uh, have to pay uh the decision maker next please Good. this is the just the uh, number you know uh close to 20 billion us dollar a year and you distribute only mostly to only six uh, uh, companies next and most of them very close to the power uh okay 
uh, uh, this is just uh, uh, to show you how they operate, they uh, 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 influence the government, they lobby the the uh, uh, parliament, you know, uh, to make sure uh, to guarantee the contract or permit extension, uh, no land restrictions anymore uh, uh, based on the uh, uh, previous law, the maximum uh, land concession is only 15,000 hectare. Now, no more. Okay, uh, uh, it doesn't uh, 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 say like this uh, in the law, but uh, it can be uh, negotiable uh, in the implementation of the law through the Peraturan Pemerintah or Government Regulation uh, just prepared uh, now, maybe uh, uh, in the near future, the government will issue the, the, the government regulation dealing with the nitty-gritty of these procedures. Next, please. Okay. Oh, this is the impact of uh, 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 export tax to nickel. I would like to... A uh, sieve uh, to nickel uh, 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 product, nickel ore. So government now uh, ban the export of nickel to you know to entertain melt uh, uh, owner, mostly from China, uh, because uh, export. Uh, uh, is banned by the government, the price of the nickel ore drop from here to here. But actually, drop uh, uh, much more dr uh, drop because uh, they ban, the government ban the, uh, the, 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 the uh, export, you know. Next, please. Okay, here the government ban, uh, sorry, before ban the export that's why we don't export anymore so uh, the previous one please so uh, uh, a b c d e reflected uh, 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 next please a b c now because no export anymore transfer of uh, uh, surplus from mining uh, 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 producer mining owner to smelters owned by uh, mostly by chinese uh, 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 companies uh, they got a lot of uh, 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 facilities a lot of incentives from the government next please so, uh, Pak Luhut Panjaitan helped them to meet Pak Jokowi recently. Uh, this is the biggest uh, uh, owner of a smelter in uh, Sulawesi and Halmahera. Next. So, the, the issue is very clear. We have to support what, what we call it uh, uh, hilirisasi don't streaming uh, process because we create higher value added right value added uh, uh, consists of uh, profit uh, uh, for entrepreneur uh, wages for workers uh, interest for banks uh, rent for landowners and some uh, goes to the government in the form of uh, royalty and taxes. This is the theory. And the reality is this. Next, please. Yeah. Okay, as I said, Don Streaming aims to increase national value added. And who are enjoying? Mining companies, local, local companies mining, pay royalties, but smelters don't. Smelter and entrepreneur, uh, the foreign, get profit. They don't pay corporate tax because they get a tax holiday up to 25 years. All the profit profits are taken home. Mining companies pay 
export taxes. If we export the ore, we have uh, we 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 uh, 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 they have to pay uh, export tax. Smelter companies don't. The entire production are exported without export ban. <coughs> so they export the NPI. We call it NPI or other product of uh, smelter, and mostly exported to the China. To China, and in China they process uh, further, and then uh, sell some to Indonesia with much higher price. The price of mining product purchased by smelter companies is very cheap. As I said before, the profit is greater than that of smelters in their own home home, 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 home country. That's why Chinese companies have flocked to indonesia mining companies pay value added tax smelter companies don't all goods imported by smelter companies are free of import duty smelter companies are free to bring in foreign workers despite of covid 19 pandemic without paying uh, personal income tax and uh, uh, surcharge charge one thousand one hundred dollar per month per worker because they don't use visa for worker they use uh, visa kunjungan they use uh, tourist visa don't stream half a heart the biggest battery manufactured in the world no way because uh, we just you know uh, uh, uh produce uh, uh process uh, uh a quarter of the total process to get uh, the final uh product so what country got nothing shall we let the fooling go on up to us thank you very much Wow, thank you very much, Pak Faisal Basri. Not only very insightful, Pak, but your presentation also made us realize that an energy crisis is very, very near. If I can use your words, even like crisis energy di depan mata. What a, what so if nice you would pack. like to have the detailed data, uh, uh, let me know. I will send you sure. uh, as much as possible. Sure, Bapak. And we also already have several questions with us. And the first one is from Giorgio Henry. Hi, Pak Faisal. What is your opinion about the newly revised meaning law and how far will the new law impact our energy and mineral resources sectors and also the economic sectors as well? Thank you, Pak. Please say it again. Yeah. The impact uh, of what law? The mining law and how oh, far mining law. will okay. <laughs> and how far will the new law impact our energy and mineral resources sector? Okay, uh, a new mining law uh, uh, give them a kind of new uh, red carpet, you know, for them. As I said, uh, no limitation of concession land land concession, uh, quote-unquote, automatic ex extensions of the contract. Uh, and they have the opportunity to use uh, forest area. And if uh, they do uh, wrongly, uh, they free from criminal uh, charges. Uh, and then uh, lower standard of and uh, amdal uh, uh, environmental impact study uh, low standard lower standard of uh, oh, right. that, that one so uh, they get everything and they are so powerful you know Luhut Panjaitan is agree, there agree. Uh, Abu Rizal Bakri Sinarmas you name it almost all of them are there including eric tohir uh, uh, brother yeah. 
uh, you see, uh, we are dictated by them. Just from Batubara, you know, just from uh, from coal. So okay, uh, the 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 production will increase uh, 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 and uh, energy mix tend to uh, 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 increase the contribution of coal in the total one so forget about environment and so on and so forth you know as uh, 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 BP statistical uh, review uh, showed you our uh, renewable energy share to the total our energy consumption is very low and the government use different definition to increase the contribution of renewable uh, energy so no more in, uh, uh, environmental uh, aspect of development no more sustainable development and uh, and so on and so forth Wow. So the only the only uh, 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 word uh, is investment, investment and investment. How to increase investment? That's why the government launched the the, the omnibus law. You know. In fact, the 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 the, the level of investment in Indonesia is not low. In terms of GDP, our share of investment is the highest in ASEAN. So that's the 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 the, the irony. So uh, uh, if I have money and I have the alternatives to produce coal and oil and gas, I will put my money to coal. So it will likely, the likely. Uh, uh, reduce the incentive to increase the exploration of oil and gas and as i show you the production will like you know prostatan and anna will drop very sharply, very sharply. Need yeah. to turn sooner sooner than uh, our uh, expectation oh wow yeah, Bapak, we also have another two uh, interesting questions. The first one is from Gracelyn. Pak Faisal, what are your thoughts about the clean energy sector in Indonesia and its growth in the near future? And how do you think it will play a role in mitigating the energy crisis in Indonesia, Pak? Firstly, we have... Uh uh potential to find out the new reserve but the, the only way to do that is one uh to improve investment climate we are in the top 10 of the worst country in terms of uh uh, investment climate uh, in oil and energy sector uh, uh, published by Fraser Fraser institutions if I'm, if I'm not mistaken that's the one uh, and the uh, uh, potential is getting uh, 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 most uh, more and more difficult to find uh, uh, mostly in deep sea and in eastern part of uh, uh, Indonesia, it's very far from from the con consumer. Uh, so we have to give them incentives. And uh, uh, the reflection of bad investment climate. Uh, recently, the shell uh, exit from the biggest uh, 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 gas field in Masela, uh, uh, what is the US product producer uh, in Rio, apa namanya? Chevron. Chevron uh, will quit from Indonesia uh, starting uh, next year. Next year, eh, yeah, next year. Uh, 
and uh, less and less production as uh, I show you but I uh, didn't uh, uh, explain the what we call it the lifting you know uh, actual production uh, of oil is getting lower and lower uh, this year uh, in the last two years uh, are only uh, less than uh, 800,000 barrel per day and uh, thirdly uh, we have to improve to push alternative energy uh, uh, not only CPO but uh, solar you know wind uh, uh, panas bumi apa namanya panas bumi uh, 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 panas bumi ya uh, oh, yeah, I forget the, 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 the panas bumi and uh, bio mass and so on so forth and Bapak we still have like maybe one or two minutes more and this is the last quick questions from Ina Jawijaya Pak Faisal Basri as the alternative biofuel is only able to cover a small percentage of our energy consumptions how feasible and efficient would be other alternatives like maybe wine or uh, wind, solar, dam, or etc. Since our country has a lot of volcanoes, how does the potential of geothermal power plants look like? Uh, uh, for uh, solar, we are not as uh, good as Australia, but now uh, PLN, you know, our electricity, the state state owned company uh, state electricity company pln uh, uh, started to use uh, uh, quite huge uh, 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 volume of uh, solar in their uh, 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 existing bendungan in jawa barat so floating uh, solar panel and if it can be implemented in many other area uh, the cost uh, uh, is very competitive if i'm mistaken five cent per uh, uh, kilowatt hour uh, lower than lower than uh, uh, lower than average uh, pln cost but a little bit higher than coal so i think we have to make correction to the relative price of coal we have to put the price of coal the components of environment environment cost or uh, 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 negative externalities should be uh, priced into the coal so we, we, it, it 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 will reflect the true price of coal uh, it, uh, non, uh, no more uh, cheap coal anymore so uh, to create you know uh, uh, fairness in uh, 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 giving same access of opportunity to all potential uh, in, in in Indonesia wind is very limited yeah wind is very limited gas bumi apa uh, 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 apa nama tadi namanya uh, oh, not, panas bumi apa sih panas bumi bahasa Inggrisnya oke okay. panas bumi is still under uh, utilized uh, the cost is very high the initial cost is very high but once you finish the project uh, no variable cost anymore Yes, uh, the, the, the God give us the the, the resources uh, free of charge, and of course we have to develop uh, the technology. So it depend on you, your uh, uh, young generation, to develop our own technology uh, uh, at the uh, 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 same time. So if we would like to increase the share of renewable energy we have
import everything. I am very optimistic. There is always a way, but don't give uh, 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 too much room to rent seeker, you know, to free rider, to oligarch, to control our natural resources. That's the key. So democratization of energy is important. Bumi, air, dan kekayaan alam yang terkandung di dalamnya dikuasai oleh negara untuk sebesar-besarnya kemakmuran rakyat. Not the wealth of oligarch. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bapak. Well, it's very, you know, very great presentation. We really a pleasure to have you with us, Bapak. Again, thank you very much, Pak Faisal Basri. Very well. Ya, sehat-sehat, Bapak. <laughs> yeah. Well, Indonesian diaspora, this concludes the webinar. Thank you all for attending. We hope you have learned a lot and enjoyed these sessions. And we still have another two days with other inspiring speakers, Hatik Basri, Mahendra Siregar, Iwan Aziz, Solihin Juhri, so don't miss it. Warekada by Permias National United States of America, the economic path of a nations. Mari berbakti bagi tanah air. See you tomorrow. Bye.